So now we'll begin. You're very lucky you get to hear Grace this morning. Grace studied English, philosophy, and theology in undergrad at Marquette University and then went on to English at Marquette for her graduate work. So um, that's a range, right? That's a lot of topics. So that, that really, I think, deepens people's understanding of everything. So she's also at lots of other jobs outside of um, education, but she has been a teacher for 20 years, five of those years at Marquette. University, and then I think she said her fourth year? Mm -hmm. Her fourth year here at Brookfield Academy. We're glad to have her. Um, I think you probably all know Grace also has five children, four of whom have already graduated from Brookfield Academy, and Rose is still here in the upper school. Uh, I also want to just tell you that this talk she shared with some teachers that I had together um, over the summer. We, I was doing a <coughs> classical education sum, a, a seminar for a group of teachers. And I invited her in, and this is the talk she gave, and we loved it so much, we made her give it to the entire primary school, lower school, middle school, and upper school. So she's done this before. So anyways, please join me in welcoming Grace Urbanski. Good morning. All right. We are in an intimate space, but I'm going to have you... Uh, do an activity together. Oops, did I just it's it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so the first thing we're going to do is um, play Guess Who. Um, I'm going to, I have little groups. I'll have four little pods of people, and you'll just get together awkwardly in one of the three <laughs> pods. And uh, four people will have a literary character on their backs, uh -huh. and those people have to ask the people around them if they um, can help them. Actually, you know what? It won't necessarily be positive. I'll just put uh, 12 people will get a literary character. And, um, yeah, they could just walk around. Yeah. So what like sorts of things that. did you uh, know about these characters? Uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, Huck Finn, <coughs> Jem, or, uh, Jean Louise Finch, Scout, and Lady Macbeth. What sorts of things do you already know about them? It didn't have to necessarily come up in your conversations, but what sorts of things do you know about any one of them? When you think of Ebenezer Scrooge, or go ahead, Bridget. The era of history and also the personality, which somebody suggested I should ask them. You know, who ask if, if the person has a, what kind of personality. That really helped. You were Lady, <laughs> Lady Macbeth. Macbeth, and yes. when uh, somebody yeah. suggested that you were some, uh, you asked if you're the I Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> like, Almost! <laughs> <laughs> Less green, but... <laughs> uh, excellent. So, um, you know about the personality of Lady Macbeth. Uh, you've, even if you haven't read it, or if it's been a million years since you've read it, uh, you know that there's something really evil about Lady Macbeth. Okay. Um, the... Um, the junior who just won our regional or our school competition for the Shakespeare yeah. recitation, she did a passage from Lady Macbeth, and it's it's so creepy. She was <laughs> <laughs> frighteningly <laughs> evil. <laughs> um, what else do you know about any one of these characters? Well, the region that they're. Placed. Okay, so which one are you thinking of in particular? Scout. Scout, where was she? Okay, Alabama. Alabama, she's in the South, <laughs> like American South. That's right. Like Excellent, so you know that about her. So, so when you think about Scout, can you picture the temperature? Yeah, you can Sticky. Swampy, Barefoot. sweaty, Barefoot. mosquitoes, Mos summer, you know. Great. Uh, I kind love this. Huck Finn a little bit. It's Huck Finn. Mm -hmm. Huck Finn, similar Spot. situation. He's on the river all the time, though, um, on his raft. Uh, what about Ebenezer Scrooge? If I say Ebenezer Scrooge, what pops to your mind? You're Victorian. Okay, Victorian. England, you've got, and now what temperature are you feeling? Cold. Oh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's winter time in the book. Uh, what else? If I, if I if I call you, curmudgeon. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it was so funny that I gave you Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of like a transformation, right? Oh, yeah. Linda always attracted to the moral compass. <laughs> You're so positive, Linda. <laughs> Great. Um, how did you? feel if um, you didn't know much about the character, or you kind of knew the name, but you, you, just, you couldn't place it, you wouldn't be, if somebody asked you, if your child asked you, 
Mom, uh, what's the story about Lady Macbeth? And, and you didn't know. Um, do you at least still have a, an impression of her? You've got this, this, um, this cultural history. I know I don't want to be called Lady Macbeth. I don't remember why. <laughs> uh, I don't remember specifically that she wishes she could uh, have the strength to kill her own baby. Um, that's, <laughs> I just, I get this vibe from her and I don't like her. Um, now, let's see if we can do something interesting with the, uh, let's pick, um, let's pick Huck Finn. All right. Um, what do you think Huck Finn would really want for his birthday? Fishing pole. A fishing pole. Great. What else do you think he might want? A new raft. A new raft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's always going to get a... Uh, what about Ebenezer Scrooge? What would he like? By the end of the book, oh. what would he like? Oh, okay. uh, peace. Peace. Oh, beautiful. Friends. Friends. <laughs> yes. Um, let's choose a scout, Finch. How does she enjoy spending her free time? Running around. Running around. Yeah. Climbing yeah. trees. Or Asking like questions. Asking yeah. questions. Climbing trees. Great. Some of these things she did in the book, some you're extrapolating uh, very logically. <clears throat> Um, what about, uh, what about, um, Scout? Let's stay with Scout. What would she want to do with scholarship money? Say she won a whole pile of scholarship money. What would she do? Yeah. Go to law school. Go to law school. That sounds a very fair, uh, yeah. guess. Yeah, it's Jem who tells Atticus that he wants to go to law school, but we know Scout would be a, a good lawyer. lawyer. <laughs> uh, what would Huck Finn do if he won a boatload of scholarship money? What I love about this is these questions are not in the book, but we seem to know these characters so well, even if we only have a vague idea, of, but we've inherited their cultural ethos, we kind of know what these people would do. And this leads to one of the first strengths of literature, when we're teaching literature not just to students, but to human persons. That's why literature is a classic choice for a soul-based education. We believe that all of the children who come to us were created by God and have a desire to know the truth, and of course we want to help them cultivate good character. Literature is one of the most efficient ways to do this, even though it's not itself an efficient course of study in a way. We talk about stories, um, and in a way, it's sort of funny because they're all fake stories, right? Huck Finn never existed. Uh, sometimes I say to my students, uh, in one way, my job is pretty ridiculous. I make a bunch of you sit around in my room and we talk about fake people who never existed, who never did any of these things. It's a giant lie. <laughs> um, but there's something very important that we're doing. So the first strength of literature is that it expands our world. These four people never existed, and yet we can make rational guesses about how they feel. We can soak in the temperature of where they live. We can extrapolate what they might do in a different situation. We know these characters. It, they expand our world. That's the first strength of literature. I think the most obvious one. My co-teacher, Katie Schlosser, she's been teaching here at BA, she's a graduate of BA, and she's been teaching here for six years, seven years maybe. Um, and one of the things she said once to her students was so captivating, I wanted to quote her. She was talking about how literature expands our world and gives us a broader set of experiences than we can possibly engage in because of the limits of time and space. She said, if I could travel everywhere and meet everyone, I wouldn't have to read, but I can't live in Tehran in the 1970s, and so I read Kite Runner, and so I read, is what she said to her students, and so I read. We can go back in time to Victorian England. We can go back to Macon County in the, 19, after, in the Depression, um, and we can be a man. We can be a, a little girl. We can be any of these things, because literature expands our experience in a powerful way. That's the first strength of literature. We'll be talking about four other ones. I think literature expands our world, inspires empathy, 
wallows in complexity, encourages consideration of and participation in universal human questions, and finally, requires analytical thinking. These, I think, are the five strengths that literature offers to our children and to our families as they become better citizens, more mature adults. So, we already expanded our world. Let's dive into it, inspiring empathy. What I'm going to do is take you through four uh, or three characters that your students will study if they take <coughs> English 11 in the upper school. These characters all come from English 11, um, and we'll start with Mama Younger. They read A Raisin in the Sun, their junior year. And one of the great <laughs> contributions of Mama Younger is that she helps to inspire empathy. One of the things that's really important in A Raisin in the Sun are the restrictive covenants that disallowed certain people to live wherever they wanted to. In this story, the younger family has been saving money for generations to try to move out of their shabby little apartment on the south side of Chicago to move into the, a home of their own. That is their dream. Mama Younger's husband passes away, and the life insurance that she collects is the last bit of money she needs to be able to afford the down payment on her home. Just a simple little home. But as she tells her son, it means something to own the floors you walk on. Mm -hmm. That is what she wants. And she's been saving and working many, many jobs, many, many low paying jobs for a very long time. The little shabby apartment they live in, she said they never meant to stay in, but it's hard to earn enough money to pay for a down payment. So they collect all the money they have, they take their legal tender to go put a down payment on a house. She <coughs> buys, she puts the down payment on and immediately is visited by the welcoming committee of the new neighborhood, who suggests to Mommy Younger that the neighborhood will pool their money and buy back the house from her at a profit because they don't really want her in their neighborhood. <laughs> and she's devastated. She didn't expect it. <laughs> and it becomes the climax of the play. What are they going to do? Here they deserve to live where they want to live. They have property rights. They have the money. They've bought it like any other human being. And they are unwelcome. Do they make the profit? Sell it back? stay in the apartment? Do they try to find somewhere else to go? Uh, a lot of different opinions within the family about what they should do. Ultimately, Mama Younger decides to, to buy the house, to ignore what the welcoming committee has said. Welcoming. <laughs> Unwelcoming committee. <Yeah. laughs> they call it the Neighborhood Association. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so the, the welcoming committee a representative comes back and he says, uh, and she gives them, <clears throat> gives him their decision, which astonishes him. He thought for sure they'd go for the profit, <laughs> not realizing that sometimes there's more to life than just money, but property rights, individuality, and um, he says, well, fine, you can buy the house, but there sure have been a lot of bombings. Oh. And the play ends without us knowing what's going to happen to the younger family. They're going to move in. The last image you see is Mama Younger taking her poor little scraggly plant. She's been trying to grow this plant for years, and it, so they have one window in their horrible little apartment, and she puts it in the window every morning, and she takes it out at night, and she waters it, and the whole family makes fun of her plant all the time, and it's the last thing that she picks up when they go to leave. And she takes a, one last look around that apartment, Oh, I get choked up. It's such a powerful moment. And she wants to plant it in her new backyard. She's never had a backyard. One of the things this play does for our students is <coughs> help them appreciate a perspective they might not ever had before. One of the things I ask them is if they've ever driven down Capitol Drive from Brookfield Road, 
say all the way to the lakefront? Have you ever driven all the way down Capitol Drive? Yeah. What happens? Well, my mom locks the doors halfway. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, why is that? Well, the neighborhood is bad. Well, what do you mean the neighborhood is bad? Well, the, there are a lot of houses that are boarded up. Some houses are missing. Right? There are big gaps between where the houses used to be. Um, it's dirty. Um, there's a lot of crime. It's, oh, okay. Um, well, why do you think that is? Is it just that... Um, and they're, they they want to be very careful. They say, well, it's some neighborhoods don't... They don't have a lot of pride. You, they can't take care of it. And they, and they, yeah, that's one explanation. There's something wrong with the people who live in this neighborhood. That's one explanation. It's not a very logical explanation necessarily. Let's go back a little bit further. Let's look at some of the conditions that brought about this. Some people wanted to leave this neighborhood. Uh, there were rules in place about who was allowed to own their own home. What happens? What's, is there a difference between when you own something and when you rent it? Oh, well, you take better care of it if you own it. Yeah. Oh, okay. And if these people were not allowed to own their own homes, what happens eventually? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Mama Younger, is she just one of those people who doesn't know how to take care of her home? Or were there things in place legally that prevented her from achieving her dreams? Oh. <laughs> Instead of then looking down on things that look like squalid poverty, you might ask a deeper question. How has this happened? How has this happened? And it, we don't necessarily have one answer, but at least we have a deeper consideration of the history of our communities. Mama Younger helps the students appreciate a perspective that might be different from their own or they might not have ever considered at all. And they come to see her as a strong and terribly brave individual where we root for her at the end and, and we're, we're scared for their family by the end of the novel, or the, the end of the play. Do you have any other examples of books that you've read where a character has presented a perspective to you that you hadn't maybe thought to consider? along those lines was a book that I read, Evicted, I think is what it was Oh, called. yes. Mm -hmm. and it takes place here in Milwaukee, well, in Milwaukee mm -hmm. itself, and that really shed light on a lot of yeah, that, laws and just things that happened. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was very good. It was it did. Was it did. Excellent. They had an exhibit, and it was just like, wow, you had no yeah. idea. It's so easy to judge, and maybe there's cases, rightfully, mm -hmm. are, you know, but then there's situations where, like this one, mm -hmm. it's just hard. It's hard, and, we, and the students learn uh, to appreciate the necessity of good laws, just laws. Like, it's what? And I show them. There was a researcher at UWM who did a, a who compiled a list of the restrictive covenants in this area um, that were on the books until the 1970s or 1980s, some places. Oh. Um, these laws specifically stated who is allowed to live here, who is allowed to buy here, who is allowed to be a servant in the home, like how many servants can you have and what race can they be. They're very specific. And the students are astonished. And we learn to appreciate then, of course, the, um, the importance of good laws, fair laws, property rights of all people. So, I love Mama Younger. <laughs> she inspires empathy. Ooh. Ignore that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know why. Literature <laughs> inspires empathy, uh, helping students to, uh, to, to feel um, the difficulties that people go through, who, uh, difficulties that they may not have encountered yet. Um, it also wallows in complexity. I love this term, and one of the characters who helps the students wallow in complexity is Jay Gatsby. <laughs> Jay Gatsby, they, they finished reading this just before uh, Christmas break, and we have a great big quiz bowl that's part of it with these impossibly difficult quizzes that make the students like memorize the whole book. And, um, <laughs> it's really fun. Um, and then um, they get to have a party at the end, and 
Uh, the students all agree that they would love to go to a party that Jay Gatsby hosts. <laughs> They're just obscene. They're the wildest encounter you can imagine. Uh, and they also admit that they wouldn't really like to hang out with Gatsby individually. He's a deeply <coughs> disturbed character. He has, if you haven't read this for a while, Jay Gatsby. Uh, which isn't even his real name. He's really James Gatz. He grew up on a farm, uh, a, a failing farm with lazy parents, as he calls them. <laughs> and he decides that he wants the American dream. He wants to pull himself up by his bootstraps and make it good. And so he changes his name and he gets rich friends and he learns how to be rich. And uh, through, it's unclear, but it's pretty certain that he gets into drugs and alcohol. It's during Prohibition, so he's bootlegging. He's doing a lot of illegal things to get his money, but he hides it very well, and he's so charming that people don't really ask too much. They just ask for some more champagne at the party. Um, throws these giant parties in order to attract his old girlfriend, Daisy. He was madly in love with her five years before, but then he had gone off to World War I, and um, by the time he's back, she's already married to somebody else. And he hosts these parties. He buys this ridiculous mansion on Long Island. And um, he keeps inviting, well, it says very few people are invited. They just come. <laughs> All these people come, hundreds of people. And they have a huge bender the whole weekend. And he's just hoping that Daisy shows up. And... Eventually, he does encounter her again, and um, they have an affair, and uh, he wants everything to go back to the way it was, and there's this climactic scene when they're at the, uh, it's a hot, hot day, the students can feel the claustrophobia of it all, and uh, there's a whole group of people in this hotel room, and Jay Gatsby says to Daisy, tell your husband, tell Tom, who's right there, tell Tom you never loved him. Tell him you're leaving him. And she says, I am leaving you. And he says, tell him that you never loved him. And she looks at her husband and she looks at Gatsby and she says, I, I can't say that. I, I did love him, but I loved you too. And Jay can't deal with that. And he says, love me too? <laughs> no. Uh, you never loved him. You never loved him. And, and the narrator, Nick, he uh, says to Jay at another time, he says, you can't change the past. And he says, oh, yes, you can. <laughs> he has a very poor grasp on reality. <laughs> and in fact, the day he meets Daisy's daughter, whom she had with Tom, he, he's so confused. It doesn't compute. Like, there's a, there's a, bodily incarnation of her love with somebody else, and he's just stupefied. He can't handle reality. So while there are some parts of Jay that are just exotic and exciting, the students are deeply disturbed by him as well. And this helps them wallow in complexity. Isn't it true that we know a lot of people, that we are a lot of people, who have wonderful qualities and disturbing qualities, sometimes deeply disturbing qualities. We love binaries. It's easier to say, oh, that person's toxic. No, I'm, I'm avoiding that person forever. It's harder to wallow in complexity. Oh, there's a lot about Gatsby that's pretty creepy, but I feel pity for him, too. He doesn't know how to handle reality. I, maybe I, I ought to not just go to his parties. Maybe I ought to spend time with him and help him realize that <laughs> he doesn't know what is going on. So uh, the students really appreciate this opportunity to realize that there are a lot of people in our lives who will not be perfect. In fact, all of them. <laughs> and this includes the students themselves. And at this point in their life, they're 16, 17 years old, they're starting to realize that despite all the rhetoric about, you can do anything. Uh, there's some things I'm not so good at. <laughs> uh, 
maybe it's a little late for me to be a concert pianist because I've never touched a piano. <laughs> like, there, maybe I'm, uh, I'm really crabby in the mornings and uh, I try so hard to be nice <laughs> and I just can't do it. Aren't there things that you want to do and you just, you just can't do them? It's still okay. <laughs> there are people who will love you exactly as you are. It's an important message for 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds. You don't have to be perfect. You can build your character all the time. But don't be so hard on yourself. You're not one or the other. You're both. You're wonderful, you're exciting, you're unique, and you're a pain. <laughs> Ask your parents. <laughs> and your parents. Uh, they may get on your case. You may be feeling like, oh, I can't wait to move out. Shake the dust of the shabby little town. <laughs> but don't you think that they've given you some very important... Don't you think you'll be missing them? Um, it is pretty complex, the world. And the generosity that you show to other people, even if it's just a character in a fake book who never existed, you learn to show generosity to Gatsby. Maybe you can show generosity to your parents or your little sibling who irritates you endlessly. And maybe you'll realize, too, how much generosity others have been showing to you. We live in a complex world, and we need to be generous. We need to soak it in. And this also helps when it comes to conversations. Um, there's, a <laughs> there's a tendency especially in the, the, the tiny little world of social media and little Twitter bites and sound bites and little things. We like to, to uh, reduce complex ideas to these tiny little aphorisms, which don't do justice to the complexity of the issues. Um, and Jonathan Stewart, um, I don't love everything he does, but there was one time when he was so frustrated that people, if you, if you disagree with somebody, you automatically push them out of your life. Well, that's toxic. You're, uh, somebody said, um, he was talking about, it. I can't even remember what the debate was at the moment, um, but the, um, the conversation on Twitter was turning someone who had an unpopular viewpoint, uh, people were calling this person Hitler. Oh, well, you're just like Hitler. Mm, no, you're not just like Hitler. <laughs> um, he said, I disagree with you, but I'm pretty sure you're not Hitler. <laughs> we don't need to be quite so quick to categorize human beings. We're a lot more complex than little sound bites allow things to be. So to give them the space in an English class where they can try out ideas, they can risk, well, wait, what about this point of view? Um, without being worried that someone's going to shut them down. As, well, that's clear. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the five stars? That's ridiculous. No, no. <laughs> they would not say that. <laughs> um, but this idea that we need to uh, let people explore their thinking, um, ultimately reaching towards a goal of civility and truth, right? We have these guiding posts, but things are very complex, and we need to let people express themselves um, even when they're not 100% correct or perfect. And Jay Gatsby teaches that really well. The next strength of literature is engaging in, participating in, um, and contributing to these huge universal human questions. This is where Hamlet comes in. And English 11 is mostly American literature. We call it the American experience. But we throw Hamlet in at the end of the <laughs> Hamlet's not American. Uh, but um, we just really want them to have um, Shakespeare uh, every year. So um, we throw in Hamlet at the end. Um, students like to know that what they're doing matters, that they're doing something real. Um, even from the time they're very little, and I think about the most popular toys often in a kindergarten room or at your home, it's like the little tool bench and the little kitchen. And the, they like to do the things that adults do. And juniors are no different. Um, they like to know that what they're doing matters, even when we're talking about fake people. <laughs> 
Hamlet is last junior year because it's so complex, it's so weighty, the language is difficult, and the topics are difficult. But by the end of junior year, most of the students are ripe for this. And I want to read something that Hamlet says in Act 4, Scene 4, when he is looking on at his rival, Fortinbras, who is rash and brave. He is taking a whole uh, ragtag militia, I call it the hobo army, <laughs> it's just out of work men. <laughs> and he, he gathers them up, um, and he, because uh, he has, his father lost his kingdom to King Hamlet, Hamlet's father. Um, the two fathers had a bar bet, essentially, and King Hamlet won, and so he's a, a, a sort of annexed Norway, and so Denmark has the, all of this power, and little Fort Bras, he's angry that he's lost his birthright. He's been angry for years, <laughs> and he's just trying to get back any way that he can to show that he's a prince and to get his land back. And he grabs this group of unemployed men and they just start attacking. Like they go to Poland and they, they grab this piece of land that is completely worthless. There's no economic value, there's no farming value, it's just completely worthless but they get it because they can. And Hamlet, as you might remember, he's been given a task in Act 1 of this play. Um, his, the ghost of his father appears to him and says to Hamlet, Hamlet, your uncle killed me, my brother. He killed me, he stole the crown, he married my wife, I need you to avenge my death. Kill your uncle. And Hamlet at first is all uh, Johnny on the spot. Ah! Give me a sword! Ah! Oh, oh, my prophetic soul! I knew something like this. Ah! Oh, it was awful. And uh, by the end of that scene, <laughs> he doesn't have a sword in his hand. He asks his friend to give him a pen and paper so he can write down what it is he's supposed to do. <laughs> Just in case he forgets to kill his uncle. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why do you need to do by garbanzo beans, <laughs> clean my room, kill my uncle. <laughs> it's kind of memorable. But, um, and then if he goes further and further away from doing what he's supposed to do. It's something that he's agreed to do, that he thinks is correct to do. And he, then he decides, oh, well, uh, I don't know if this ghost was telling the truth, so um, I'll act crazy. And that'll help me decide if I should do this. <laughs> not strictly relevant. Uh, and then later on, when that's not really helping him much, he decides, oh, I'll put on a play. A play of the thing that I think happened, and then I'll see if uh, the play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Um, so all of these things that aren't killing his uncle, <laughs> but other things. And sometimes the student is frustrated, because Hamlet is Shakespeare's longest play. And we feel every word of it. It's very long, and we read every word. Um, and they get really frustrated, like, oh, come on already! <laughs> Which helps us to think, do you guys ever procrastinate? <laughs> Have you ever decided, oh, as soon as I get home, I'm going to do my, I'm going to read my Hamlet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do instead? Well, there are <coughs> YouTube videos to watch, and I haven't read any of my Snapchats yet today. <laughs> then it's 10.30, and then, you're, oh, I can't read now, I'm too tired. I wouldn't do justice to the <laughs> text. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, so the first question, this first universal thing that they're asking about is, is our a tendency to procrastinate. Why don't we do the things we know we are supposed to do? And why do we do those things that we know we aren't supposed to do? This is a, a timeless human question. Why can't I make myself do the thing I know that is right? And why do I persist in doing the thing that I know takes me away from my goal? Why are we like that? And these universal questions are important because it also helps them have a less progressive view of history, what I mean is a more humble view. 
we have a tendency, we moderns, to assume that with all of our health technology and all of our uh, digital technology and the strides we've made in aeronautics and medicine, all these things, that we are somehow superior to all the people who came before us. Our ancestors were <laughs> quaint, <laughs> um, but really don't we know a lot more than they do. And maybe we don't have to listen to the traditions and the organizations that came before us because we're clearly better in every way. And when I ask them these things about human nature, well, you're really frustrated with Hamlet. Do you ever get really frustrated with yourself? Oh. Um, have we solved the problem of procrastination? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> or don't you think that there is some wisdom that transcends time and place? Don't you think there are th lessons we learn from the people who went before us? Maybe give a little bit of a benefit of the doubt to the structures, the organizations, the traditions that came before you because they've been around for centuries and you've been around for 16 years, so <laughs> <laughs> just maybe give it up. Um, so we come back to, so these are, this is, these are the universal questions. They realize that they haven't invented everything. And as special as they are, they are part of a tradition of humanity that they can contribute to, but they're also receiving this wisdom. And there are poignant lessons for them to learn as well. This moment when Hamlet sees Fortinbras coming back victorious from earning this stupid little piece of land from Poland, he feels really disappointed in himself. And he watches Fortinbras marching through, and he says, how all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. What is a man? If his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed. Is that all I'm here for, to eat and sleep? A beast, no more. Sure, he that made us with such large discourse, looking before and after, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fust in us unused. Now, whether it be bestial oblivion or some craven scruple of thinking too precisely on the event. Am I overthinking this? Am I a coward? Because I just am overthink. Um, a thought which quartered hath but one part wisdom and ever three parts coward. I do not know. Why yet I live to say, this thing is to do, so that I have cause and will and strength and means to do it. Don't I do the thing I'm supposed to do? God made me. Hamlet is a very religious person. God made me, but I'm not carrying out any vision for my purpose in life. And he gets so depressed that, of course, we know one of the questions that Hamlet asks himself is whether he should even stay, alive, stay living. Should I kill myself? to be or not to be? It's a very serious question. And frankly, it's a question that our students, by the time they're juniors, have some experience with, maybe personally, but they certainly know somebody who's been in that horrible position to think, maybe my life doesn't mean anything. But Hamlet remembers that he is created by God. And he does have a purpose. He's just not getting to it. And that helps save him. And the students can ask themselves, what is my purpose? Have I ever felt worthless? And Hamlet, the play and the person, can help them consider that at these dark moments that may not have come to them yet, but might in the future, I am created by God. I have people who love me even when I stink. <laughs> right? The lessons from Gatsby, wallowing in complexity. 
the lessons from Mama Younger, that things are very difficult, and it's not either you're perfectly happy and everything's going right, or you're terrible, that we live in this middle all the time, and it's worth it. It's worth the struggle. They need to hear this message, and they're ready to hear this message. It's a universal human question. What am I here for? What is man? <laughs> One student once asked me after we read Hamlet, and we've been through Mama Younger, and we've been through Gatsby, which ends tragically, and we've been through uh, Huck Finn, which is frustrating, and we've uh, we've been through The Heart as a Lonely Hunter, which is sad. So I said, why do we read such sad things? <laughs> and I said, because life is sad. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the kind of lessons we learn best are the ones that are the hardest to deal with. Sometimes suffering is the way we remember things. There are some of us who can simply read a book about somebody else or get instruction, oh, never drink alcohol in college. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely, I, it's not even a temptation. <laughs> um, but really life is quite a struggle, and it, part of the character education of Brookfield Academy is to show you some of these struggles, some of which you already feel some of which you already have some experience with, but some of which are brand new perspectives to you. But reading can help you know what that's like and not have to learn it the hard way. Some of us are going to learn it the hard way, right? <laughs> but we don't have to learn it the hard way. And literature, unlike any other topic that they read, sometimes history, um, but literature, because we can spend so much time with these characters and actually start to feel what it's like to be them. We know what it's like to live in their city and to have their clothes on and to talk to the people that they talk to. We can have a vicarious experience and say, with Katie Schlosser, and so I read. Before you think, good grief, <laughs> The American experience, English 11 is like a big <laughs> sob fest. <laughs> They're just talking about their feelings all the time. No! <laughs> their feelings are important, but when we're studying in a classical situation, literature, we value critical thinking. We value analytical thought. And so, in my classroom, at least, my students know, you can ask Allison, <laughs> they are not allowed to say this phrase. I feel like when we are talking about literature, <laughs> they stop themselves very quickly. I put this on the board. I feel like, I feel like, Huck Finn. <laughs> like, no! Because <laughs> as soon as you take, as soon as you reduce this conversation to the level of emotions, I can't argue with you if you feel like, you're a, an Italian sausage. <laughs> oh, I see. What is that like for you? I can't argue with you. You feel that way. I have to just value your feelings. But if you tell me you feel like Jay Gatsby is probably um, a thwarted dancer, and if he had just been allowed to express himself, <laughs> okay, that's a weird feeling, but it's yours. <laughs> no, it's critical thinking. So we turn this into the evidence suggests. Oh, wow. So. <laughs> <laughs> They need to know that their feelings are important, that I value their feelings, I, and, and empathy is a feeling. I want them to feel that for those characters, but when it comes down to the scholarship of literature, you must root yourself in the textual evidence, 100%. Anything that you have to say about the text has to come from the textual evidence, and not just cherry-picking, but taking the complete work as a whole, we call it the hermeneutic circle. There are parts of the book, and there is the whole message of the book. And the more of the parts that you focus on, it's the better you understand the whole message of the book. And once you realize what some of the major themes are, it helps you to understand these parts 
um, more uh, thoroughly. So they have to root their interpretation in the evidence of the text. And when it comes to rhetoric, which is the last of the trivium, uh, the school is based on the wisdom of the medieval trivium. Logic or grammar comes first. The memorizing things, getting categories in your head, understanding where, di where the world fits into different categories. Logic comes next in middle school. It's where you start pushing back, well, why? And you love to find out that parents are hypocrites. Well, you don't go to bed at 9 o'clock. Why should I? Shouldn't it be fair for everybody? Well, John gets to go to Dave and Buster's every Friday night. Why don't we? This is logic, right? Which is infuriating in the hands of an 11-year-old. But it's an important movement in the development of the mind. And lastly, there's rhetoric. And you can't really achieve rhetorical excellence until you can think of people other than yourself. Rhetoric is all about framing what you have to say in a way that is most effective for your audience. So you have to know who your audience is. You have to care about who your audience is, right? Middle school, you know, it's all about you. Um, and you're in grade school, you don't even know anybody exists. <laughs> I just don't memorize stuff, right? Uh, but in, in upper school now, you're, you know who your audience is. You see what makes them tick. And you try to adapt your message in a way that's not manipulative, but simply generous. All right, I think, and I ask them to give me examples of rhetoric in their own lives, and they think about, well, when you want to have a later curfew some evening, how do you start? And some say, well, I do all my chores first. <laughs> or some of them who don't have chores. <laughs> uh, why don't you have chores? <laughs> They'll say like, um, oh, well, I'll make sure that I get my homework done. Or I'll say something like, um, uh, mom, I know that you think it's really important for me to be safe. And I want to be, you know, I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> Does it work? <laughs> so they start to understand how they can frame their argument in a way that is persuasive to their particular audience. That is what rhetoric is all about. Aristotle says rhetoric is the art of persuasion. Um, so they learn that there can be more than one interpretation of a text. Um, they can all make sense, right? Just because someone disagrees with you about how to interpret a detail of a text doesn't mean they're Hitler or an idiot. <laughs> um, but that we can have more than one interpretation, and the skill of adulthood is making a rational case that is persuasive to more people than your rival. Um, this, we all have the same evidence. It's similar to the impeachment situation or any trial. We all have the exact same evidence, the same documents, the same testimonies, the same version of events, well, not always. <laughs> um, and somebody's going to prevail over another person because they've, uh, they've collected the evidence in such a way and presented it with rhetoric that seems more plausible than the other person. That's what adulthood is. And you're not ready to do that when you're six or seven. You're not ready to do that when you're 11 or 12. But by the time you're in high school, you better start thinking in those terms. Not everything is easy. Not everything is simple. Not everything is binary. Get your facts straight. Collect your evidence. Go back to the text. So, rational, analytical thinking. Uh, important part of using literature in a classical education. So we've had, um, we've expanded our world. We've inspired empathy, we've wallowed in complexity, we've encouraged consideration of and participation in universal human questions, and we've required analytical thinking. <clears throat> One last note about how we approach literature at Brookfield Academy, and especially in the upper school. We do not tier English in the upper school until senior year. Every ninth grader takes ninth grade English. Every tenth grader takes tenth grade English. 
remember the eleventh graders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just had to finish it. <laughs> um, and we do this for two reasons. One is to double down on that idea that the study of literature is partly the study of the collective wisdom of Western civilization. Um, you might genuinely have a child prodigy in math or a child prodigy in music, but you can't really have a prodigy in wisdom. Um, some students have had um, more suffering um, than others, and that tends to speed up the wisdom process somewhat. Um, but you can't grow up faster. You can't be wiser necessarily much faster than your peers. It's the sort of thing like you, there's certain things you've learned only because you've been a parent, right? You just, you can't get that wisdom until after that happens. Um, certain things that you learn once you've lived on your own um, that our students don't, don't yet know. You can't really rush wisdom. So it's an equal opportunity approach to literature. We want to make sure that every student knows your contribution is important. It's not like this person's wisdom quotient is so much higher than yours, we're going to have to put that person in an accelerated English class because, wow, the wisdom is just... <laughs> um, everyone's contribution is important. And everyone has some wisdom to share. So our, our approach to soul-based education informs the way that we teach it. Everybody needs to participate. We need your contribution. You know things about humanity that this student doesn't know because your grandparent has died. Or for whatever reason, everybody has something important to contribute. Uh, the other reason we keep people, uh, the students all together, um, is that idea that I said before, that it gives us a, a humbler approach to the idea of history. Um, that we have these universal human experiences, and we should experience them together. We should read the same literature together. The collective wisdom of Western civilization is something that we all need, and we all can discuss it. Um, and learn that we aren't actually smarter than everybody who's ever preceded us. So uh, it's an equal opportunity sort of approach um, and an approach that acknowledges the universality of human nature.